Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Elhamdülillahi Rabbil Alemin. Ve salatu ve selamu ala seyyidina ve mevlana Muhammedin. Ve alihi ve sahbihi ve azbacihi ve zurriyeti ecmeyin. Allah'ım Rabbin arayna al-haqqa haqqan vardukna tibaya ve arayna al-batila batila vardukna ictinaba. Allah'ım arayna haqqa yakil aşiya kemahiyye. Rabbana zidna ilma ve amelan ve ikhlasan ya Rabbil Alemin. Allah'ım ansır avliyak fi gazı fi kulli mekan. Allah'ım ansırum ala adubi ve adubi minneke ala kulli şeyin kadir. Allah'ım ufaricanna ve nikhvanna fi gazı fi filistini kulliha ve fi kulli mekan. Allah'ım nafiz karbana ve karbama sebed akdamana ve akdamana. Altuf bina ve bihim ya arhamar rahmin ya akram al akramin. Sallallahu aleyhi ve sellem ala sayyidina Muhammedin ve alihi ve sahabihi ve azvacihi ve zurriyeti ecmain bir rahmetike ya rahman rahmin. Okay, we're going to look at, we start from here, the cosmological argument. The cosmological argument, let's go back a bit where we started yesterday. So just to keep the continuity. Um, scholastic philosophy has put forward these three arguments for the existence of God. These are arguments known as cosmological and teleological and the ontological argument embody uh, a real movement of thought in the quest after their source. So it's a human being's search for the truth. But as regarded as, regarded as logical proof, uh, abstract from that search, the natural curiosity. So that's a natural curiosity of humanity to know the truth or the absolute. Or in Hegelian terms, you would say, search for self-consciousness or self-understanding. But as a logical proof that abstract from that experience, historical experience, I'm afraid they're open to serious criticisms. So, uh, and further betray a rather superficial interpretation of the experience. So, as far as the understanding of human experience, a human cu curiosity to understand the absolute, to understand the experience, they are superficial. But they indicate human curiosity, human uh, curiosity basically about why uh, the basic human curiosity about uh, so the b basic human curiosity is about why there is something rather than nothing or something else so that's the fundamental human curiosity of wonder as uh, Aristotle would have called it we can see um, these uh, ontological, these uh, arguments for the existence of God as part of this curiosity or manifestation of this curiosity. Although <laughs> by trying to provide the answer, definitive or definitive, definitive answer to this curiosity, they try to uh, basically also um, foreclose <laughs> this curiosity, as Heidegger would have said. Anyway, so how um, Iqbal um, sees the utility or the positive side of these argument is that they are manifestation of humans' struggle to understand the truth or the absolute throughout the history. But as logical argument, they they, I mean, the, at the logical argument, they have their own benefits in the sense that unintended benefits, the side benefits, it increase our logical apparatus, uh, 
powers of abstractions and all those things. But as far as the answer to the question concerned, uh, the answer the question is not uh, settled, obviously, and can't be settled for the reason which will become clear. Because uh, at most these arguments, what they can do is to prove that they are probable. And probability, you know, can can give you some indication of where to go, but it doesn't provide you any definitive answer, if that's what you are looking for. Okay. So the first argument um, in this context is the cosmological argument. Cosmological argument starts with what exists, what is here, and from there it tries to argue for the existence of God, a being which is separate from this cosmos, but initiates it or creates it, depending on your worldview. So the cosmological argument views the world as a finite effect. And passing through a series of dependent sequences related. So first we should uh, say that cosmological argument is not one argument. It's a type of argument. And you will find different forms in Christian philosophy, Islamic philosophy, and then modern philosophy, and and and, and in ancient philosophy, obviously, as well. So it's a type of type of argument, not just one single argument. So different variations in it, for example, one you will find in Ibn Sina, the Ghazali, etc. And this type of argument is very important in. Uh, some, some uh, uh, in Islamic ilm kalam as well, especially Ashaira and Matridi. Um, that's why they start with, like in Shara Laqaid, they start with proving that, uh, you know, refuting the Sophists because they thought that Sophists didn't believe in the existence of the cosmos. <laughs> they doubted the existence of cosmos. So if cosmos is... Uh, doubtful, then you can't argue for the existence of God from there. That's why first they try to refute the sophists, for example. Anyway, so the, co cosmo the cosmological argument views the world as a finite effect and passing through a series of dependent sequences related as cause and effect. Stop at uncaused first cause, and this uncaused first cause is called God, because of the unthinkable, unthinkable, unthinkability of an infinite, infinite regress. Unthinkability. So the argument is that. So I'll just keep. Um, for the sake of convenience, I'll just keep myself focused on what Iqbal is saying right now because there are a lot of other things which we can talk about, but they will come, if not today, in, in the coming days, inshallah, we'll, 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 we'll spend some time on cosm these arguments. So the cosmological argument. Presupposes certain things. Um, it start from what exists, the world. The world as the total as the totality of what exists. Let's see. Now, this uh, cosmological argument makes a lot of presuppositions. Obviously, those presuppositions are not proven, 
not proven. And most of the time they say there's no need to prove them because they are self-evident. And self-evidence, if there is something is self-evident, then you don't need to prove it. Uh, in uh, in in uh, Muslim, Muslim logicians would say tasil uh, hasil. That's trying to achieve something which is already accomplished. But just to um, look ahead, for example, how can you problematize this sort of thinking? Self evidence is always um, relative to your milieu, your education, your socialization. So self evident for one uh, group might not be self evident for other group. Um, it's not a form of relativism, it's not just uh, stating the fact. Uh, and you'll see in Tahafatul Philosophy, uh, Imam Ghazali uh, he makes use of this sort of uh, thinking uh, and problematizes uh, philosophers, Muslim philosophers, uh, the, for the, the disciples of Greek philosophers in the Muslim world. Against them, he makes this argument that what you call self evident is not self evident, otherwise, all rational people would have agreed on that. And since we don't agree on them, they, it can't be self-evident. Anyway, so cosmological argument uh, depends on a lot of presupposition. The first presupposition, which I, I guess is so, treated as something self-evident, is that the world exists. And as we know from the modern philosophy and, and even ancient philosophy, you can't treat it as a self-evident truth. <laughs> Uh, at least in, in, in abstraction, you can problematize the existence of the world. Doubt and all those things. Um, and Descartes and all those things. Um, you, you don't have to actually believe that the world doesn't exist, but you can still say that you, can, you can't prove that world exists. So on the analytical level, for example. So the world exists, that's the first presupposition. And the second presupposition is that um, this world cannot exist on its own. So the first presupposition is that the world exists. And this one is easier, <laughs> because probably more people would be inclined to believe that. Uh, and world exists and um, it doesn't exist or it can't exist by itself because then it would have to come from nothing to something without a cause which is something impossible. And this is treated as self-evident as well, I guess, or proven by experience. Obviously, you can ob object to that as well, because something is our experience, but nothing is beyond experience. So how can we project the laws of something to nothing, for example? Okay. <laughs> the way we are going, I think we are going to have to spend a lot of time in on this one, a lot of sessions. <laughs> we'll see. So that's the setting. There's nothing to something. So it doesn't, uh, cannot come into existence on its own. But there's another um, presupposition as well that uh, the world cannot be eternal. Now, there might be physical reasons to believe that world can, cannot be eternal, for example. The arguments drawn from physics. Um, but on the basis of logic, um, to say that world cannot exist from eternity, because if you can believe that, and a lot of people did believe it, or even do believe it, even today, if world exists 
from eternity, not in this form, but in some form, then it means you don't need any cause for it to come into me. But uh, those who argue for cosmological argument, they believe that it's, it's unthinkable, it's impossible. <laughs> now, impossibility, when they talk about it, it can be physical impossibility, so that uh, would have to leave to physicists, physicists, uh, and I'm not sure whether there is any sort of consensus, but Imam Ghazali has made some sort of arguments in Tahafa regarding that. But obviously, he, he didn't have any uh, knowledge of the physics of today. Um, so physical impossibility, logical impossibility. I, th I think uh, logical impossibility, I'm not sure uh, how it can be logically impossible, logically impossible. Um, To, th to say that world has existed because it doesn't seem to involve any contradiction as far as I can see. But I think what they mean by logical impossibility is it is unthinkable, impossible to think. So a lot of logic, uh, at, at least uh, um, logic before Frege and all this is mixed with psychology as well. Um, and people think that because it is Im impo unthinkable for us, impossible to think or imagine that world, well, that means it is logically impossible. But that's not true. Unthinkability and unimaginability is something contingent, something conting contingent to our education uh, uh, sort of minds we have uh, that should be differentiated from logical impossibility at least that's one of the arguments okay so the these sort of um, this co any cosmological argument has to uh, presuppose these things at least we have uh, it it has to presuppose that uh, world exists it has to presuppose that it came into being so it wasn't there at some point. And it has to presuppose that the uh, world cannot exist eternally. Uh, and all related, um, all related presupposition on either it has to presuppose that self-evidently or has to provide arguments to prove these presuppositions. So that's, we haven't even started uh, on cosmological arguments, but I think that's a good point to stop here. We'll just go back to the text and see if so we miss anything or we need to see anything else. Uh, otherwise, we'll stop here for today. So the, the cosmological argument views the world as uh, a finite effect in passing through a series of dependent consequences related to the causes and effect stopped in an uncaused first cause because of the unthinkability of an infinite regress. So uh, we haven't uh, finished this fully. So we have to go through what we mean by effect and dependent sequences and cause and effect and then uncaused cause and also unthinkability we talked a bit about that and then we'll get to infinite regress what is infinite regress and why is it impossible or thought to be impossible by the proponent, pro, proponents of the cosmological argument or arguments okay we'll stop here inshallah and we'll continue from here next time subhanakallahu wa bihamdika nashadu allah ilahi illa nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk wa sallallahu ta'ala ala rasuli khair khulki wa nuri ashri muhammadin wa alihi wa sahbihi wa tawajihi 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 wa tawaj